discuss about global health financing today. Um, but just to give you a little bit of Raja's um, background, is he did his BA at Stanford um, in history, and then went on to Oxford to do a PhD in international relations uh, as a Marshall Scholar. Then came back to Bay Area uh, and did, uh, well, while he was at Oxford, he also consulted for WHO and worked on the global the economics program there, global, gov global yeah. gov economics yeah. finance program there. Came back, did his MD here, um, and then uh, became a, our inaugural fellow for the Global Health Program. He's also an affiliate at the Center for Democracy, Development, um, and the Rule of Law while he's doing his residency here. So he's one of our first fellows that's spending six months on and then doing his research, six months doing, well, which is on. On is doing your research <laughs> and six months off doing residency programs. <laughs> um, but he's spending an extra year um, doing this track. So um, welcome, Raja. I look Joe. forward to hearing about where right. the money goes in global health. All right, well, thank you all for being here and thank you for uh, inviting me to come to Gary. So um, I'm excited to be sharing uh, some of this with you, and so by way of um, background, what we're going to be doing is I'll give you an overview of um, global health financing. Um, and for those of you who were here last month, um, Dr. Barry did a presentation that did an overview of the major institutions, the big actors in global health, and hopefully this will allow us to follow up on that and dig a little deeper into where these institutions are putting their resources. Um, and what I hope to do is challenge your beliefs on where money in global health goes and why. Um, but first, um, you know, everybody here is a clinician. Um, we're not all trying to make or, or change policy. And the first question is, why should this matter to me as a clinician? Um, and really, for me personally, it was clinical work um, that sparked my interest in this topic. And um, I'll tell you more about that in a second. Um, but first, let's just give a quick overview of um, some major trends in global health financing. Um, by way of background. So uh, I'd like a guess. What is the country with the highest total health spending per person per year on, on health? U.S. And estimate about how many thousands of dollars? It's about, yeah, exactly. So about $6,100 uh, per person per year on health um, here in the U.S. Um, obviously, there's a huge range worldwide. Um, and some countries, most countries, spend dramatically less than we do. Um, any guess, I think it, it'd be, any guess as to how much uh, money per person per year the poorest country in the world spends on health? Yeah, you guys are pretty much in the ballpark there. Uh, Burundi comes in at the bottom at $2.90. Um, so obviously there's a huge gap in spending. Um, and a lot of people have put some thought into developing minimum packages that are essential to deliver decent health around the world. And WHO in particular has an estimate um, that it costs uh, what they think are the minimum amount of spending needed to provide basic life-saving services around the world. Guesses it to this amount? Probably less than that. So $35 to $50 um, is what experts around at WHO are estimating are the real minimum amount that you need to provide basic medical care. Um, so how many states in the world are falling below that threshold where you factor in all sources, personal contributions, government contribution, um, other, other private sources, um, and donor assistance? We have about 64 countries in the world that fall below that $35 to $50 threshold. Um, Something that we all deal with here, and the reason I put this is, is we're all focused on hospitals. So a lot of talk goes into development assistance for health, which is about $14 billion a year total. So worldwide, donors of all colors and varieties, um, from the private sector to governments, Gates Foundation, everyone, worldwide puts in about $14 billion a year into development assistance for health. How much money is wasted through hospital inefficiency worldwide? Uh, it's a far bigger number. Um, it's about $300 billion a year is being wasted just through hospital efficiency. So you can imagine by, by improving that sort of system, we'll do far more good than we would by increasing even commitments and development assistance for health. So about half um, to two-thirds of all hospital spending around the world is thought to be unnecessary um, and due to inefficiencies in the system. 
And I think these figures are actually usually higher in developing countries than they are in um, developed countries, where you see um, hospital spending consumes in most poor countries anywhere from about 70 to 90 percent of their total health budget. So um, far from an efficient use of resources. Um, now the question is, are all diseases equal? And do all diseases get their share amount of financing and attention? What this is meant to represent here is we've got money bags underneath some diseases. This is Neviropine, for those of you who can't read it from far away, where, for example, HIV AIDS is, is quite relatively generously funded around the world. Um, by relatively, I mean we're certainly falling far short of the needs, but compared to other diseases, um, providing much more. So for HIV AIDS around the world, for each disability adjusted life year, which is a measure that we use of morbidity rather than mortality, we're giving about $1,100 um, in development assistance for chronic non-communicable diseases, including diabetes, heart disease, it's about $3.20. So there's a huge gap there in terms of where international resources are going. Which brings me to how I became interested in this topic. Um, and uh, so I was actually doing clinical work during medical school um, at the Suba District Hospital in Western Kenya. And uh, when I was out there, I was spending some part of my time um, in an HIV clinic and another part of the time in the regional hospital, the regional medical center. And while I was there, um, something really struck me in that we, while doing morning rounds, actually it was on a pediatric ward there, um, we had a, a patient who came in who was severely undernourished. And um, the doctor um, who was seeing him, mother was carrying him, very scaly skin, the doctor who was seeing him quickly made a diagnosis of kwashiorkor. And I imagine the pediatricians in the room here um, know much more about this condition than I do. Um, but one of the things that really th that surprised me at that point was the attending physician, um, when he asked if the baby had HIV and the answer was no, he seemed to give up all hope and he became disappointed. And the reason for that was because if this baby did have HIV, they would have had the resources to take care of him. They would have been able to provide food for the entire family. Those resources were allocated and set aside. Um, and because he didn't have that diagnosis, they, they were told that there was nothing the hospital could do. And this is something that this hospital was facing repeatedly. Um, there was a clear divide in resource allocation. And it was, it was not a divide that was being made by the local doctor. It wasn't a divide being made by the local Ministry of Health. But it was a division that was uh, probably fostered and facilitated by the policies of international donors. So we could see that key decisions about clinical care weren't being made by the people on the ground, but were being made by people in London, Geneva, Washington, DC, New York. Um, and so you begin to realize that these policies have a real impact in terms of the cl clinical care that's being provided. And so that's what really got me interested in these questions about global health financing. How do we set priorities? How do we choose where money goes? Why do we give money to some diseases in some countries and not others? Um, so again, it really is rooted, I think, in, in, in clinical work. And so let me go. What I'm going to do now is um, <coughs> we'll, uh, I'll try to dispel a few common myths about global health financing, um, myths that I started with and myths that I think are still um, quite common. Um, I think the first myth that we all it seems very commonly assumed is that people assume that poor countries rely on donors to fund their health services. Uh, that's simply not the case. Um, any ballpark estimate, what percentage of total health spending in Africa comes from donors? Anyone want to venture a guess? So I'm hearing, I'm hearing 30%. Raise your hand if you think it's higher than 30. Okay. All right. So, uh, not many things higher than 30. So the, the, the number is um, right now anywhere from 65 to 10% of health spending in Africa comes from donors. It's 0.3% of health spending worldwide comes from donors. But Africa is obviously where most donors are concentrated. And what you'll notice that's different than health spending in rich countries is the biggest chunk here is private out-of-pocket health expense. And national governments have this, this other relatively large chunk. So when we're talking about donor financing for health, 
and setting the priority agenda, we're actually talking about a pretty small portion of the total health spending. So why does donor financing matter so much? That seems a valid question. Clearly, global health um, expenditures in poor countries are, uh, are, are coming mostly from out-of-pocket. What you see here is this is GDP per capita along the x-axis, and then this is out-of-pocket health expenses. So as countries get richer, the out-of-pocket expenses go lower and lower. Pretty significant relationship there. And so poor people in poor countries are much more likely to be paying out-of-pocket for their health care than rich people in rich countries. Um, so then why, why exactly are we all hung up on development assistance if it's just such a, such a tiny part? Well, first of all, development assistance has been rising rapidly. This shows you from 1976 till a few years ago, a rapid rise in development assistance. This is similar, and it shows you a breakdown here of which, what sorts of institutions are, are giving this aid. As you can see, the majority of development assistance remains coming from bilateral development agencies and uh, regional development banks, um, with NGOs playing a, a much larger role, but still um, a really second fiddle to the government agencies and regional development banks. Um, and so clearly, we're, we're, we're seeing more money, more donor money in, but still, pretty small part of the pie. Um, so the next myth that I think is a common one, um, which relates to the first, is that donors are setting priorities based on the health needs of, uh, of that population. Um, and so what I'm going to argue is that actually donor priorities aren't based on health needs of the population. They're not really rationally based if we look at where disease burden lies in terms of which diseases, nor are they rationally based on the health needs of the world population if we're asking which countries actually have the most illness. And so um, this is a, a, a quick graph from a, a paper I did with some colleagues that looks at um, on the x-axis, we've got mortality, and up here, total disbursements. And so you could see pretty sharp divide where um, you know, non-communicable diseases, I mentioned, this is, more, this is uh, mortality rather than disability. But uh, non-communicable diseases right here, about $3. HIV AIDS, about $2,500 um, per death per year. Something that's generally considered very low in political priority is maternal health. But even that still gets about $500 per, per death per year huge divide, doesn't seem that we're really distributing resources according to which diseases are killing the most people. Um, so um, we tend to say that what we're actually distributing resources to are these priorities that we've established as a global community called the Millennium Development Goals. And Dr. Barry gave us an introduction to these Millennium Development Goals as priorities for health that include everything from maternal health, child education, HIV, AIDS, malaria. Um, but I'm going to argue, actually, Millennium Development Goals aren't necessarily developing country priorities. Um, ask yourself, how were these goals created? And these goals were actually, um, they're not new. They were created in 2001 and officially adopted the Millennium Development Goals in 2001 by all the heads of state. But these goals have their origins in the official priorities of the international development agencies that all get together in this forum called the OECD Development Agency Cooperative, the OECD DAC. And they all got together in this forum, and they basically adopted these donor goals and turned them into worldwide goals. So these are goals that are easily measured. Um, they're goals in which we can track progress. They're goals where we could say infusing money can make a quick difference. But they're not necessarily the goals that developing countries had for themselves. And they're not about you know, building health systems, building sustainable infrastructure. Um, these goals are really about measuring results and measuring results as quickly as possible. And a lot of people in developing countries might argue that these goals are actually what have led them away from their own priorities, away from, say, contributing the resources, as many people in interviews have told me, to non-communicable diseases because, well, if they're not in the Millennium Development Goals, donors won't fund that. Um, which raises the other question is, how is it that these donors, with just this small fraction of money, just a 6%, how is it that they're able to exert such strong influence? Um, and the reason for that is that donors are strategically, even though they're only putting up a small amount of the money, um, they, what they, they, do, they take two strategies. One, ministries of health in poor countries, in about 23 countries in Africa alone, 
Um, ministries of Health re receive the majority of their own ministry budget from donors. So by paying for the ministry's operating costs, they can get ministry plans to reflect donor plans. Um, so you're effectively buying policy on the cheap. Um, which, and then the second aspect of it is that with, um, with, uh, with the small amount of donor funding that goes in, they can require additional funding to come in from the national government, from private sources, as a way to diversify the funds. So they set the priority agenda and then realign the in-country finances towards um, meeting those. So brings us to myth three. So we've talked now about disease priorities and how we get the priority disease areas where we put money. Um, but what about which countries get money? And uh, you could argue quite, quite reasonably, I think, that actually um, this is far more permanent. So if, if uh, Kenya is getting money to do HIV AIDS, they might be able to shuffle some of that money into other disease areas or spend it on defense, whatever else. Um, there was a recent paper that came out that argued that for every dollar in development assistance that came in for health, 37 cents remained within that healthcare sector. I, I'm disputing these results. I don't think they're actually accurate. But nonetheless, there is some shifting of money from development assistance to other, to other areas. But when you put money in a certain country, it's very unlikely if you give money to Kenya, they're going to reallocate that money to Uganda because Uganda needs it more. Um, that's simply not going to happen. So country selection is a really important area as well for donor assistance. So how do we choose who gets it and who doesn't? Um, and so these are the countries um, that are actually getting, uh, getting the most money. And what you see is the ones in red there are, are getting the most money. And so you've got um, Namibia, <laughs> N Namibia. Um, getting quite a bit of money, and then uh, Guyana here, um, and then uh, you've got Uruguay getting a lot, Papua New Guinea getting a lot. Um, and so you see that there's a pretty high concentration in some countries, and some countries are surprisingly left out, even though they're, they're poor. Um, uh, so this, uh, yeah, so this is Jordan. Yeah. Um, and they get quite a bit of resources, um, mainly from the United Nations Relief Works Agency for Palestinian refugees, because um, they house half, more than half their population are Palestinian refugees. Um, and so are we funding the sickest countries? So uh, you can, you can um, take a look at this overall trend. And what you see is that, on average, this is, and on the x-axis here, you've got disability-adjusted life years per capita. So it's a measure of how sick, on average, is, is our people within this population. And on top, on the y-axis, here you've got um, average development assistance for health from 2000 to 2009. And so what you see for the most part is as you get more sick, you get more money, uh, but up to a certain point. And then the countries that are the sickest, we tend to think that there's not enough infrastructure. Donors tend to think. There's not enough infrastructure there for us to do any good. The conditions are too unstable. The governance is too bad. Um, and so people aren't going into this bottom range of countries, Niger, Angola, Sierra Leone, Afghanistan, Congo. Um, and so these countries are actually relatively left out of um, global health financing. Um, and some places um, that have become you know, relative success stories for some donors, um, or places where donor countries have strong emotional attachments, um, uh, get quite a bit more. So huge range here in terms of how much money goes um, to each country. Um, just to give you an idea, um, for example, um, Zambia, which gets less money than Namibia, um, was getting about $31 per disability adjusted life year um, pr from the United States alone. That's 582 times as much as a country like Venezuela. But perhaps, and that reasons for that might be obvious, but um, what about a country like Cameroon, which Cameroon and Zambia have nearly identical GDPs, um, about 1,200 US dollars each, similar rates of HIV, HIV tuberculosis, and malaria. Um, but uh, Cameroon gets 1 11th the amount of funding as Zambia. So how do we explain that? Um, th th these are political explanations. I presented this once to an audience that included some scholars from Cameroon and Zambia, and they quickly pointed out to me that, well, maybe that's because the health minister from Cameroon spent the last few years in prison and countries didn't want to deal there because of corruption. So you have 
a lot of political factors and economic factors that come into play that don't really have anything to do with you know, what are people dying of and why. So uh, finally, you might say, well, miss one through three didn't fool me or Jay, come on. Um, obviously, donor states are just giving money to pursue their own interests, um, which would be a really rational explanation. And political scientists would love it. They would eat it up. Economists would love it and eat it up. That doesn't seem to be happening. Um, so there are two ways in which we might kind of break down the interests that states have, right? So we might say, that, well, countries are going to want to prevent the spread of disease into their own countries. So here, here um, on the x-axis, we've got what I call the contagion index, which tells you how fast a disease spreads, how likely it is to kill you um, if you do get it, the international threat that's posed by that disease. Um, and then on the y-axis, we've got how much cooperation we see, primarily financing. And what you see is for a lot of non-contagious diseases, like population control in the 1990s, diarrheal disease, even malaria, which doesn't really have that much of a risk of spread to rich countries, um, nutrition, get quite a bit of funding. And something like HIV AIDS throughout the 1990s, um, even smallpox eradication, even though it was considered a great success for the, the 30 or so years before we did it, there was virtually no cooperation. You couldn't get a, a dime out of the US and other rich countries to support it until the campaign really took off. So sometimes really contagious diseases aren't getting that much money. Um, and obviously, HIV AIDS here is, is, is the outlier. So you might say, OK, well, maybe it's not about preventing disease, but what if it's about trade and security interests? Um, and so we've tested a bunch of these um, imports, exports, oil production, natural resources. How unstable is a state? So is it going to potentially collapse and lead to become, become um, a haven of instability that could cause regional turmoil? All of these things um, didn't have any statistical significance, nor could we really construct any kind of coherent narrative out of them. So it doesn't seem like those factors are explaining it. I could go in later on into what things might, might be explaining it. But I'll keep moving now with um, myth number five. And this is something that comes out of uh, Dr. Barry's talk from last week, that there are tons and tons of actors in global health. Um, I think uh, you called it alphabet soup, didn't you, um, where you have so many of these institutions that are popping up to do maybe similar work. Um, it's true there are, there are lots of players in global health, but I'd argue that most of them don't really matter. Um, and so this is the billion dollar club in global health. So these are institutions or organizations that are giving out a billion dollars or more per year. And so at least in terms of global health financing, these are the only ones that really matter, I think, in terms of shaping the priority agenda. Again, billion dollars sounds like a lot, but it's really, you know, in terms of overall health spending, pretty trivial. So we have $14 billion in development assistance for health every year, but then we're spending $4.3 trillion worldwide on health. So I think to have a meaningful financial impact, billion dollars is a pretty good threshold. So Global Fund is just about a billion a year, also with a $10.5 billion endowment. The Gates Foundation gives out just over a billion dollars a year now. Um, and has a $67 billion endowment, um, including the money that Warren Buffett contributed. And then the United States government has been giving out 3 to $5 billion a year in recent years, um, with $46 billion formally committed. And the World Bank gives out 3 to $4 billion a year, um, no endowment, but um, through annual, uh, annual contributions. Yeah? Yeah, they are. But these are, yeah, so this, th these figures, um, th they, do, they do that, obviously. Uh, but these figures are, um, for the U.S. government, for example, the U.S. government's the only one that would be contributing to the World Bank and Global Fund. And their contribution to those institutions is removed here and counts towards the U.S. contribution. Um, and the U.S. has been giving less and less to the Global Fund as we've more or less done things unilaterally. Um, another myth that people often uh, <laughs> come with is, um, well, with the Gates Foundation, there's plenty of money to, to, to save lives in Africa. There's plenty of money to, to really do global health well and do it right. Um, and that's actually not the case. And the reason I put Africa as a, dem as a regional indicator there is um, that actually most of the Gates Foundation money um, goes to the U.S. and Western Europe. Um, and what kinds of institutions get Gates Foundation money? Um, what you'll see is, uh, 
NGOs get a huge chunk of it. Um, universities doing research get a big chunk. Global health partnerships, and these are usually with an intergovernmental organization like WHO, um, get a sizable portion. But very little of this is actually going towards um, implementation of services and programs on the ground. It's primarily going to research. Yeah, and so the way it breaks down is 24% of the total amount that they give out it's, um, goes to service provision. So healthcare delivery in total is about 24.1% of all this. So all of these do some kind of service provision. Um, and then that 24.1 breaks down into about um, half of it being public health and then half of it being medicine. So um, about a quarter of their money goes towards um, on the ground service provision. Um, but one of the things that's um, often been raised is what percent of the money goes to U.S. organizations. Um, it's actually quite a high figure, about 82 percent of uh, Gates Foundation money is go going through U.S. organizations, so acting through the United States. It's not surprising. Most um, philanthropies give primarily to institutions in their own country, uh, but an observation I think it's worth noting. Um, we can pause here and ask for questions on what I've presented so far, or we can save them until the end. Tyler? Um, so you showed a number of graphs that show sort of the amount of money that's being allocated to a particular country or a particular problem uh, compared to either what the disease burden in the country is or what the disease burden from a particular disease is. Is there any, do you have a graph that shows sort of the amount of money that's allocated to a disease compared to the sort of bang you get for your buck? that make sense? So yeah, of course. somebody might say, well, yeah. if I contribute five more dollars to combating HIV, it can buy retrovirals for this long, whereas if I contribute five dollars to you know, combating whatever diabetes or something, there's really just not that much we can do with that in Africa. So it's better to buy the antiretrovirals than to buy the you know, whatever the diabetes or something. Yeah, and that, that's, that's certainly been done. Um, there's a great uh, paper that I can send you that was in, in Lancet like 2006 that, that tries to do that. Um, and uh, the highest bang for the buck interventions, not surprisingly, would be public health interventions. Vaccinations always number one on that list. Um, and then that's um, followed by some surprising things that made the top ten. I could, actually, I could pull that and, and send it to you, but some of the other things that make the top ten are like speed bumps on roads is, the number one, is one of the top ten interventions to prevent you know, accidents and, and, and mortality through that. Through that. Um, the majority of these things, though, that we're talking about where money goes certainly don't make that list. Um, even though I, pr I personally believe providing antiretrovirals is a good thing, that, that's nowhere near that top ten bang for the buck, and that's where the majority of, of U.S. financing goes. Um, and so a lot of people were very critical of that bang for the buck approach um, because of the fact that it doesn't take into account um, factors that uh, people think matter, um, things that relate to human rights. So um, the fact that we have created a drug and made it expensive, therefore do we have a moral responsibility to try to share it? Um, um, other, other ethical questions about where we have maybe have some kind of causal influence on people's health outcomes. Um, in general, um, I think ethicists feel like there's a greater role and responsibility when, once we have a new technology that can be made widely available and scaled up. And so people have usually taken that long-term perspective to say, let's actually create this, this, this intervention that will have a long-lasting impact, like vaccines and things that, even though they don't fig factor on the bang for the buck scale now, maybe they will in the future. So um, the other thing to think about is not just which has the greatest bang for the buck, but which ones are we best in place to do. So um, you know, if you're an international donor and you're going to go in somewhere, um, it's probably harder for you to build a functioning system of health clinics that would provide care for chronic diseases than it is for you to quickly deliver antiretrovirals that are made in your own country and distribute them nationwide, something that you could do quite efficiently. So people also want to maximize their own impact rather than you know, just the, the population health impact. One other question I had is if you brought in, say, Bill Gates, or there were like one person at the head of these, each of these organizations, which I don't know if there is, but if you were to bring them in and say, how did you decide where to spend your money? What do you think, for instance, that Bill Gates would say? Bill Gates has answered that question. 
And so what he, what he says is uh, he read um, the, the 2001 World Bank Development Report, Investing in Health, um, and decided based on reading that, that he was going to give his money to these 10 priority disease areas that were killing the most people around the world. Um, but his, his selection was based on picking those diseases that selectively killed people in poor countries but did not kill people in rich countries. Um, so those diseases that were more likely to be neglected. Um, and so that's exactly how he made his decision. Was bang for the buck with vaccines. I mean, if, you, if that whole foundation is focused on vaccines, the bang for Absolutely. the buck. Yeah, and also creating a legacy. So um, they're focused on vaccines, they're focused on technology creation. So, um, you know, we got rid of uh, childhood diarrheal in this, in this country and in most rich countries by cl delivering clean water, laying pipes, <coughs> building infrastructure. Um, and now the focus is on creating new technology. So um, they have 40 different vaccines underway that are targeting childhood diarrheal illness. Um, and so it is very much a tech, technology-centered approach that they're taking. Um, for better or worse, that could create a long-lasting legacy and get rid of these problems forever. You don't have to replace maybe these vaccines like you do pipes once you've eradicated them. But it's also probably a much harder challenge than just putting that same amount of uh, financial commitment towards developing infrastructure. So there's a lot of debate on that focus on technology. Um, how are we doing on time? Okay. All right, good. So um, the next uh, question I wanted to raise is how can we actually make global health funding work better? Um, and by work better, I mean work better for poor countries. Um, and so to understand some of these external influences on policy making in developing countries, um, about three years ago now I put together something that we call the High Level Working Group on Setting a Developing Country Agenda for Global Health, where we brought together about 14 um, developing country health ministers um, and had them talk about um, how they set priorities, how they interface with donors, and how we can make that interface work better. And so they actually said some really interesting things that I just wanted to share, kind of some of the highlights from that with you, because these were their ideas. And I, after this, I want to get your ideas on how we can make um, international health financing work better for, for poor countries. And so one of the things that keeps coming up is national health plans. And so the participants were sharing their strategies for negotiating with donors um, and saying that leadership from a national level and creating a national plan is essential. So the, I'm going to read you a quote from the Kenyan minister, um, Charity Ngilu, who was telling me about her approach to donors. Um, so she says, the Ministry of Health in Kenya was rather being run by our donors, saying what needed to be done. We need, first of all, to have a meeting with them and tell them where our priorities were and what we wanted to put, where we wanted to put our available resources. Of course, at that point, there was a lot of resistance because that business had gone on for a long time. And they would not put money where we wanted to put money. Until at one point I said, you may want to do your business, but don't do it in our health sector. And then they came back and asked, what do you want us to do? And so she was making a clear case for putting forward a strong national plan and saying, if you wanted to work in this country, you had to work within that. Um, this was reiterated by many of the other um, ministers, but um, one of the ministers admitted they weren't doing this. Um, and... Um, you know, sticking to that national plan can be undermined by fear that, you know, these donors that are supporting you know, the Ministry of Health in particular might walk away. Um, and for heavily donor-dependent countries, that's a really stark alternative. It could be, I mean, it means, it means lives. And so reflecting on the refusal of PEPFAR to participate in the national approach um, agreed to by all the donors, the Ugandan minister told me, quote, we have never put our foot down. We fear we are cowards. So they didn't, they didn't actually tell... Um, the President's Emergency Plan for AIDS Relief, how to do things, and they um, let them have free reign, which is something he seemed to regret. Another theme that kept coming up was uh, participatory decision-making. Um, and so once governments have the space to set their own policies, um, they can use participatory mechanisms um, to ensure that policies actually reflect the needs of their own people. Um, and so there are a few successful examples of this. One was um, in Thailand, they created a national health assembly. Um, I'll just read you what the, how the Thai minister explained that. He said, the Thai National Health Assembly brings together citizens from all parts of the country, civil society and parliamentarians, to collectively decide on policies. And similarly, in India, they had a different approach um, where their deputy minister described that the National Human Rights Commission of India would hold public hearings 
um, access to health um, that was used to actually hold state officials responsible for ensuring the broader health of, of their constituents. Um, and so uh, in, in Kenya, they did another strategy where a percentage of the federal budget um, was set for regional projects, and that was decided at the community, community level. Um, and uh, so one more thing that came out of this, too, similar, to, uh, you can see that these fall in a similar vein. It's about giving developing countries more control, was the idea of South-South coordination. What I mean by South-South coordination is developing countries coordinating among themselves to actually create, um, create their own um, negotiating block. Um, they do this in other international fora when it comes to trade policy, for example, at the World Trade Organization. There's a lot of that kind of coordination that goes on. But reflecting on this need, the Minister of Health from Mozambique um, was a big champion of this. And I'll read you a quote from him. And he says, what happens is there's an exploitation of weaknesses in countries. If the donors see that country A has strong leadership and direction on what they should do, they're not going to mess around. They go to another country where they can do things differently and that country will accept. We need to get a grouping of countries with one voice that say, if you want to deal with us, let us be together. And what we have to achieve is the country benefit, not for donors A, B, or C. And so he suggested that a coalition, quote, will give political, <coughs> political voice to countries facing the consequences. Other, me other members suggested this would also help provide a defense to developing countries. Um, and so I think one of the things that really came out of that for me was really allowing for developing country leadership um, would allow some health issues that weren't priorities for donors, like smoking, heart disease, maternal health, nutrition, the development of health infrastructure, um, to actually be addressed. And national control of health policies um, might have saved the, the child who I introduced to you um, earlier in this talk, who, who died from undernutrition. So I'd like to get um, your ideas on how to make this work. Any thoughts that you have? Any reflections on, on, on this topic in general? You know, how do you think we can make global health financing work better? Question. Yeah. I'm sure the answer is probably like your entire dissertation or something like that. But I'm curious, the, the folks from those prime ministers and other health leaders in countries almost make the relationship with donors sound antagonistic. As if the donors come in and say, as if the donors go around looking for sort of politically weak countries that they can exploit and then go to those countries and say, we'll give you this money, but only to do these certain things that I say that it's for. But you went through in the beginning of the <coughs> presentation and went through what might be some sort of obvious ulterior motives, right? That the countries are, or that the aid organizations are saying, well, we'll give you the money because they're, I don't know, trying to protect their own countries or because they're trying to exploit oil yeah. profits or whatever. So if none of those things pans out, but if the ministers perceive that there's this almost antagonistic relationship with the donors acting like they have ulterior motives, whether they do or not, what causes the antagonism? I mean, why? Yeah. Uh, I just, that seems strange. Yeah, that's a very good question. I think it's um, probably still not totally answered. But <coughs> the biggest takeaway point that I would have from this is that the, the divide between what donors want and what developing countries want doesn't have to do with necessarily donors' material interests and exploiting oil um, or natural resources, although with China being an exception where that is quite explicit. Um, but for the most part, um, it has to do with their need to actually demonstrate results. So they're choosing countries where they've got established programs that have been successful, where they can build on existing um, in donor-run institutions in country. Um, they're choosing disease areas where they think they can have a quickly measurable impact in a short period of time. Um, and those pressures aren't becoming because they're bad people. Those are, those are coming out because of the fact that if we're going to keep funding PEPFAR, for example, in our country to provide AIDS relief in Africa, um, or the subsequent variations of that, that we actually have to have some demonstrated success to come back to Congress, come back to taxpayers, and say, this is what your money is doing. So there is a fundamental divide, I think, in who donors are accountable to, being their own domestic constituencies, and who the ministers of health are trying to serve. Well, that's right. Can I add one thing? Can yeah. I think it's also part of um, this idea of colonial legacy mm -hmm. and a power relationship that sort of sets you up for an adversarial. Having said on some of these foundations that give money, no matter how how part of 
partner you are, there's still that colonial legacy that's there. That you have to be very... Don't you agree, Pasha? Oh, absolutely. That, absolutely, yeah. And, and donors choose their favorite countries as well. So um, the you know, British government really, they, they had a strong colonial legacy with like Kenya. Um, and so they, they have tons of programs there. Um, the United States has taken on a, a few a few countries that you know we might call our darlings. How our relationship that sort of sours um, dialogue afterwards. I, I think. Yeah, absolutely. And colonialism really was, I mean, at, at the end of it, at its core, it, it was about creating a set of global standards and regulations. That's what the whole colonial enterprise was was that was about. And so, in a way, we're trying to do the same with health and health policy, where we're creating you know standards for how you deliver health care. We create our own policies and regulations, and so it feels very colonial when you have one group of people telling another group of people what to do, even if the motive is altruistic, or we, we perceive it as altruistic. As remember, at the time, uh, colonists perceived what they were doing as altruistic as well, so it's still very much the same project. Please. Uh, just a comment and a suggestion. The comment is um, that pharmaceutical companies um, have been shown to have increasing influence on the agenda of the Gates Foundation and other foundations, and of course they, they produce magic bullets, which um, means you can, if you only look at not all cause mortality, but vaccine-specific mortality, you can show better results. Um, and, and the newer vaccines um, are several times more expensive even for the poorest countries than the vaccines on which the, the classic argument of there being the most cost-effective intervention uh, is, is made, and a lot of them are less efficacious. Um, the suggestion is uh, the, world, uh, the WHO has developed a tool for planning of national plans based on benchmarks of fairness, and it's been used in about six countries now very mm -hmm. successfully. Uh, it's a way in which um, uh, members of the, uh, of the government and, and providers and, and other key stakeholders can develop a, uh, a national health plans that meet a specific criteria of fairness for funding and delivery and outcomes. Hmm. And I think it's, it, it's, it's been sort of field tested and proven in five or six countries, but could be used a lot more. I'm not familiar with that. I'd love to yeah. see. Yeah, please do. I'd love to read more about it. Uh, Amish and then Patrick. Just uh, to play devil's advocate or just to defend um, the large uh, donors. Um, I think one is the issue of, of corruption, which you know varies by country to country. But I mean, certainly in India, for example, you mentioned the National Human Rights Commission, which doesn't really have the power to indict any individual who's, for example, not um, doing their job, or if there is a misallocation of funds, they can hold hearings. But there has been uh, there have been multiple instances in which that commission has been used. So mm -hmm. there's always that issue, and it is sometimes, uh, yeah. you know, uh, large donors are certainly always, uh, there's a yeah. foot to them looking at where they're donating. Absolutely. Donors. I think, sorry, go ahead. Oh, no, please. I think the other, the other benefit of having some of these large organizations is sometimes they do provide the job training and the skills and creating spokesmen in individual countries that sometimes large governments uh, don't do. Certainly many, many uh, bureaucracies um, aren't focused on yeah. creating individual spokespersons or whistleblowers, for example system are able to point out um, yeah. irregularities in the financing system. I think the other issue is just going to geopolitics. I think it is valuable and important. For example, polio, which, you know, there's obviously tons of controversy of whether, you know, donating a ton of money to polio is really bang for your buck or whatnot. But, um, you know, when, when a polio outbreak does break out in northern Nigeria, for example, and then it does suddenly spread out to um, other countries within West Africa, Donating money more to that area right. might seem like a waste of money in the sense that you know there are many more um, yeah. communicable diseases or many sure. more severe illnesses. But, but when yeah. that outbreak does occur, it does impact trade communication. Okay. Um, and so you yeah. know, I can imagine a donor saying that it is beneficial to donate towards that cause. Absolutely. So I'll, I'll respond quickly to both those points. Uh, first, about corruption. Um, and so I think you're absolutely right that corruption is something that often factors in. And if you think about donors wanting to maximize their allocative efficiency, that is, we want the most bang for every dollar that we give, then there are a few ways in which you, a few criteria that you would seek that you should be met. One is you should be 
targeting your money to the countries that are the sickest, the countries that are the poorest, um, and the countries that will spend that money most efficiently, meaning it won't be lost in, in corruption, it kind of follows in that same logical pyramid, right? It's about allocative efficiency. Um, and corruption has been used in decision-making processes by donors, and it's come in and out of favor through various cycles. And so um, in the 1970s, 80s, and until the early 1990s, corruption wa was one of the factors explicitly used in formulas by the World Bank um, that would choose which countries would get funding, and then those, those formulas came out of favor. And now we have a new trend where it's coming back in favor. Um, for example, the U.S. government created something called the Millennium Challenge Corporation, um, which gives out money um, where instead of, usually the way it's done is um, money is given to a country and then we're there, we, it's done with conditionality, meaning that you have to implement X, Y, and Z reforms to keep getting money. And what the Millennium Challenge Corporation does is that conditionality comes before the grant is made. So we say countries that have already achieved X, Y, and Z in terms of improving their governance and their corruption, um, then these are the countries eligible for the grant. So that's something that is coming in favor. Empirically, are we actually giving money to countries that are less corrupt? Um, this is something that I've been looking at. And uh, the answer is only in Africa. And so you could be cor corrupt anywhere else in the world, and there's no real statistical, um, statistical, statistical relationship between corruption and how much donor money you're getting, unless you're in Africa, where corruption begins to matter. Um, so there is a bit of a divide in terms of the logic that we're using as a donor community in terms of which states we're asking to be not corrupt versus which states are, not, are corrupt. Finally, on just continuing that point to play devil's advocate back, um, there's been some really provocative research suggesting that countries um, that are corrupt can actually um, use uh, money more efficiently um, because you can actually make the system work faster and better and it supplements uh, salaries in the public sector and you can recruit talent. So there, there are some people that say actually corruption might be a good thing for implementing um, development policy. About the polio question, um, so, so yes, a lot of people are saying, you know, it actually works out to, and it came up in the paper that I did, um, one, the, one of the charts I showed, polio was really high up there. And so um, it works out to we're giving about a million dollars per death per year for polio, um, roughly speaking. So if we took a narrow context and said, you know, what's the impact we're going to make this year, then you'd say polio is an awful investment. But that's not the way it works when you're targeting eradication, because that means forever. And so there's a different mathematical, uh, w different math at play here. And so with smallpox eradication, for example, um, the smallpox eradication campaign involved $300 million of total international money over the entire duration of the campaign. That's pennies. That campaign pays itself off every 28 days for the U.S. alone. Um, and so when you factor in that long-term projection of not having to vaccinate populations, getting rid of the morbidity and mortality associated with disease, preventing future outbreaks, you enter a totally different paradigm. Um, so you can't really make it on annualized, um, annualized projections. Patrick? That's a great talk for Jay. Um, I had a question about how you know, you brought up China and how that's kind of uh, affecting these relationships now between donor countries and, 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 uh, and donors and, and, the, and the receiving countries in that now they have sort of an alternative with a much clearer sort of, you know, access to resources for donor money, you know, if they go with, if they, if they go with China versus the traditional Western model. And how do you see that sort of affecting some of these relationships? Yeah, I'm not an expert on, um, you know, Chinese development policy, but in particular they've gone very heavily into Africa. And, um, and uh, they've, 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 they've uh, focused on the way it works with them is it's not based on conditionalities or, or even requests for policy reform. It's an explicit agreement that's typically made between their development agencies or, and, 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 uh, and d deals with the government on access to resources. Um, or um, in increasingly commonly, not just access to resources, but the rights to build big infrastructure projects for them. So they bring in laborers and they get to build the infrastructure and then extract all that wealth. Um, and so. Nobody really knows quite the scale of it because none of the data on this is public or available. Um, and so it's a big unknown, except that we know that it's huge and increasing in size. That's the best. I don't know if anybody else in the room can speak more to that.
you see any effect now of that giving the countries more leverage to say, hey, you know, rather than all these conditions, we can just go talk to the Chinese? <coughs> So, again, so, so uh, yeah, I think he's asking if countries might feel like they don't have their hands tied well, as much. That's happening all the time. We'll go to the Chinese. We'll yeah, the no, that definitely happens. Yeah, um, and so it seems like an easier way, than maybe than getting a World Bank grant, if you don't want to tackle corruption and don't want to do all these other things. So that's why I think the main mainstream donors feel a little threatened by um, China's increasing role is that their influence on policy is going to be dwindling. Um, and so that's, that's certainly a concern. Um, could you speak a little bit about whether there's been any studies done on cost, effective, cost effectiveness of putting money toward in-country training programs and you know, creating more medical schools or preventing brain drain? Or just build, you know, you spoke about a lot of the inefficiencies of hospitals yeah. and you know, providing incentives for governments to train local yeah. In country residents to I think those systems well. the best evidence I've seen has to do with um, training minimally skilled health workers. So instead of training people to become doctors outright, um, you train people to perform X, Y, and Z procedures or to um, become you know, a, a, a caregiver within their community that can take care of a certain number of basic conditions. Um, that's, see, that's argued by some people as an answer to brain drain. It doesn't seem very fair because the way you're getting around it is you're not giving them enough skills to really be valuable as an immigrant. Um, but at the same time, the education costs is a lot lower to provide those kinds of um, basic health education. Uh, and then you can develop people that will remain within their community. You have to remember that the biggest part of a, dra a brain drain is not people leaving their countries and going to rich countries. It's people living rural er leaving rural areas and going to cities where they can make more money and work in hospitals. And so um, that also helps uh, address that problem. I think Michelle probably knows a lot more about this. Just for medical schools, I know a little bit more about that, because Fitz <coughs> Fitzy Mullen and, um, has been coordinating a large effort by PEPFAR. As PEPFAR moves away from giving antiretrovirals, more into health system strengthening, they just put in $150 million to partner 15 schools um, with sub-Saharan African medical schools. We're actually one of them at the University of Zimbabwe. I can tell you it's really hard to work with a faculty that's only 30% of them are there. And it's hard to get our <coughs> faculty, which is a very small faculty, to leave for long periods of time. I'm really struggling with this grant, even though I have it. Hmm. So. Yeah. Another, I think, tying in what Dr. Barry said was a big part of brain drain also is absenteeism from jobs. So people that are officially working in the government health sector um, will instead go and work in a private clinic on their own and then not actually provide those services. So I think that's probably what you're facing in Zimbabwe. Well, people are just leaving Zimbabwe too. Okay. <laughs> yeah. Please. Shifting gears a little bit. Can I ask you to introduce yourself? I'm sorry. That, I don't know. Sure. Yeah. It starts to be my chair. I'm actually Pete's intense. Okay. Stuff. Great. Thank you. Um, shifting gears a little bit. That, that's that's uh, something that a lot of people have been arguing with the Gates Foundation about. Um, so it's uh, it's a point of contention. I think nobody really knows knows can demonstrate a hard answer. But what we do know is the empirical answer, which is well, this is the way the rest of the world took care of waterborne illness as a problem was through infrastructure. Um, we didn't have the vaccines then. We don't have the vaccines yet. And so we're really venturing into the unknown. Um, with the initiative, I think, to really pursue vaccines aggressively. And the, the other thing is, you know, we, once you create a vaccine, there's also the challenge of how do you deliver it um, to people everywhere. And if it's more than one, if it's 30 or 40 of them, how do you, how do you get it there? Um, are these going to be things that will survive the heat? 
um, survive long periods outside of, of um, you know, refrigeration. And so there's a lot of concerns that come up with taking this vaccination approach. So I think it very much is a gamble. Uh, well, there's some well worked out packages for sort of whole village interventions um, that have been in Lancet and New England Journal of Medicine, but they don't seem to be as sexy and appealing as magic bullet campaigns <coughs> for the boards of, of uh, foundations. Okay. So, uh, are we, I think I, I got a cue to wrap it up. Do we have any burning questions? Okay. Well, this is just some, uh, if you want to read more articles um, on this, there's some good overviews of, of global health financing here. I don't know if they're big enough to read from the back, but um, a few good articles on uh, basically financing trends, um, sto a narrative by Laurie Garrett that I think is a good primer on this, on where money goes and why, um, and assessment on the Gates Foundation. So that is all. Thank you all for coming. The preceding program is copyrighted by the Board of Trustees of the Leland Stanford Junior University. Please visit us at med.stanford.edu.